Okay, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, today is uh, December 10th, okay, Saturday. Uh, that's our 2022 uh, last section of Asian philosophies. So uh, let's, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, I just show the schedule uh, we have go through the, for the uh, basics the whole year and the last few section last uh, week we talk about Hinduism free will and then uh, we insert basic right now in go through the Chinese history we are in the uh, time of uh, Northern Song Dynasty. So if you look at your time frame, it's about uh, 10th century. And in the Europe, if you are familiar with European history, that's the, I think the first crusade okay, uh, during the uh, Western Europe. Uh, so that's the time frame we are talking about. And during this time frame, the major philosophy I'm going to introduce is Confucianism, uh, which is, uh, later Western philosopher called, called uh, Neo-Confucianism. So uh, that's, uh, we have been through a few weeks we talk about. And uh, today we are talking about a specific school which has been viewed as the orthodox school of Neo-Confucianism. Or you can call it that's orthodox of the orthodoxy uh, Confucian school. In another way, most of people in Eastern Asia understand uh, Confucianism is based on this philosophy, even it has many, many different schools. So that's the uh, subject we are going to cover today. So uh, after today's session, we will go to 2023, that will be next year's uh, uh, project. So the subject we are talking about, I call it the school of universal, the school of universal principle. So uh, the philosopher I introduced, uh, his name is Cheng Yi. Okay, and uh, last month I introduced the person, and uh, that's his older brother, just one year old. Uh, his name is Cheng Hao. So these two brothers, they have the similar philosophy about similar interpretation of Confucianism. But uh, since Cheng Yi, the younger brother, lived 22 years longer than his older brother. So his philosophy kind of the change after his older brother died. And his philosophy become the orthodox of the later uh, Confucianism. So uh, the name, Chinese name called Li Xue, and they have many, many different uh, kind of translation. And, and, and here I'm going to choose the word, uh, the school of universal principle. Okay. So uh, that's the, uh, uh, today we are going to uh, cover. So there are the four uh, subjects I'm going to cover today. So, uh, since uh, today we have uh, probably have a lot of new people here, so I'm going to give some political background because uh, all the Chinese philosophy is always political, especially Confucian philosophy is very, very political. So that's always have tied to the political uh, 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 during the time. So second thing, we will talk about go to the philosophy itself, which I call it universal principle. Okay. Then uh, look at his argument and that in, in scholar, scholarly, uh, in, in academic, we call it anti, uh, ontological argument. And then number four, we will finish our section. We talk about moral cultivation. So uh, before I uh, move to the first section, I will pause for one minute. If you have a question, uh, concern, or anything you want to ask. Oh, or you want to share how you think about uh, today's uh, KB, please. 
Yes, hello. I have not had a chance to see most of your previous presentations. Is there a place that they are available online so that I could catch up on what I missed? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I will. You you can go to the meetup page and uh, scroll down, and then uh, you can see the uh, meetup page. Uh, the uh, information. Let me let me share this one, and uh, then uh, I go. Uh, Joe, you have a question or? Oh. It can wait. It's about the ontological argument. I just was curious about what it was an ontology of that we. Became. Okay, we, I, we, I can we, we can talk wait. about this. Yeah, yeah, you can wait. Yeah, I think you can wait. So, uh, you okay, thank you. So I'm going to put on the chat. Uh, let just let me. The one I can put in the chat. Uh, Okay, uh, KB, I, I, I'll, I'll look for it, Jason. I'll okay, yes, it. please. Okay, please. Okay, yeah, so, I, I don't want to interrupt you much. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so let's go through a few background. Okay, so uh, if just uh, because this kind of presentation is very difficult because I cannot expect everyone uh, to attend every single section or know the background. So every time I want to make sure even you have no idea and then you will you know, get something, okay? Or you already listened to the previous section and you still learn something new. So that's the challenge I have. So uh, I will always start from the basic. So if you find out you are lost or you are not very sure, please raise your hand or let me know or let Joe know. Uh, um, so I will start at a further explanation. So <clears throat> we talk about the time in the eighth century. That's the so-called Tang Dynasty in China. That time being usually being considered as golden age because that time the Silk Road is built, okay, and the, the Buddhism uh, monk traveled to China. So. The capital city in China is kind of international city like New York today. Okay. So it's very international, the considered as the most powerful uh, uh, state, not only in the world and also during the Chinese history, 2000 years Chinese history. But at the about ninth century, have the so-called Andusan Rebellion and the whole empire corrupt. And as they corrupt, the go to the Syria, the uh, a period we call the five five dynasties, ten kingdoms, which happened in the tenth century. So this one you can see in this ten, uh, this hundred years in China, you can see the map. Uh, the dash line is today's China. Uh, that's just a small part of the south part of China. Have the breakdown to the ten different small kingdoms. And they and this kingdom are not stable, so they keep changing. So people, uh, the historian call five dynasties. That means in the capital area, uh, has been changed five dynasties. So that means every dynasty probably only lasts for twenty years, twenty five years. So you can see the dynamic during that time. Okay. So to the eleventh century, hundred years later. Okay, Noren Song, historian called Noren Song. Okay, then we at that time, of course, they, they don't know they have another Southern Song. So they call it Song Dynasty. Song Dynasty, eventually, you can see uh, the founder, okay, unite basically most of the South part of China. So become a united, so called united, but only under partially united. And the, they have other kingdom, but majorly on the north, on the northeast, that's called the Liao Kingdom. It's uh, uh, dominated by the, it's uh, governed by the uh, so-called Kitan, Kitan uh, people. In Western Europe, uh, people at that time, they could call Chinese uh, Kansai, right? That's, that's the time uh, when I read uh, Voltaire's uh, during their writing, the Enlightenment writing, they will call China Kasei, okay? Kasei is Liao, and which is Kitan, uh, Kitan uh, people. And another kingdom is Western Xia, okay? That's the Tangat people. So they have the different kind, 
technically in this land have a three kingdom. And then, of course, these two are uh, uh, a nomadic people. And then I'm going to focus on the Song dynasty in this area. So you can imagine during that time in China is partially united, okay, basically the South. And they have the two foreign countries, powerful, military powerful country. One is Liao and one called Western Xiang. Okay, that's the two kinds. So basically they have the three kingdom uh, during that time. So let's look at the Song dynasty. Okay, so I copy from, uh, I think this one from Colombia, uh, Eastern, Eastern Asia study. Okay, so we, I, I'm not, I showed this one before, but I'm not going to go too detail about uh, uh, during this time, but some key point is here. First, during this time, <clears throat> China has been very well developed economically. So they, the production already have non-agricultural goods or so-called sometimes called the cash crop. Okay, so it's something sold not for consumption, okay? Just like a tea, tea leaf, right? So like the cottage industry, this kind of thing. And this society, basic economics called the pre-modern society. And one important is uh, urban, uh, urbanization, because at that time already have the city life, okay? In the capital, it has a lot of city. And during the Song time, there are an enormous growth in Chinese population and the shift the locus, the, the population become dense in the southern part because the weather is warmer, they have the more enough water. So uh, the agriculture is much well developed. Another very important thing is on the eighth or seventh century, uh, there's a tyrant called uh, uh, Qin Yang of Sui, okay, that's a tyrant. Uh, but uh, usually some tyrant did a terrible thing, but uh, tyrant also built to build a great construction, okay? So he built a great canal, okay? They connect from the two major river. One is from the uh, Yellow River to the uh, uh, Yangtze River. Uh, we will show this map here. Okay, that's the map in the town on this side. On your on this side, uh, this side you see the cursor on this side. So that's the, the the capital city, the center of China. And the, you will see this one is the Yellow River. This one is the Yangtze Yangtze River. That's the two major river in China. And the, the river uh, flow from the west to east, west to east. So the cultural center basic based on the Yellow River. Okay. But the rich part, the agricultural rich part is on the Yangtze River on this area. So in the Sui Dynasty, about 200, 300 years before this time, the, they built a great uh, grand canal, connect the Yellow River to Yangtze River. You can see this map here. So basics, the food, rice, okay, can transport from south to north. So during this time, the uh, Song Dynasty, after they unite the South part, the economic is very well. A lot of population have enough food, even on the Northern part, okay, has a foreign country, but in the Southern part, it's a rich place. One way we can see it is there's a famous painting called Along the River During the Qingming Festival. Okay, if you search on the Google, you can see it. If you have the chance to visit Taiwan, uh, I, I personally have seen it uh, a few times in the uh, so-called uh, 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 Chinese Paris Museum in Taiwan, Taipei City. Uh, they have the uh, so-called a score. Okay, this score is painted. Uh, it's a, it's a very long five. Uh, this so one the dimension is uh, two hundred inches long and not very tall. Okay, so that's a great picture and it's very long. So I only capture two small, uh, two portion here. You can see here's a, a lot of people here. So you look at this one, they have the uh, city, they have the night market, 
and the very modern, like today's city. So I think everyone probably will agree with me. In the 10th century, China, if you are the regular people, not the royal family, you know, the general people, probably China, the, the southern part of China is the best place to live, all right? Because that's a, a kind of the modern city, all right? You, in this way, you can see and uh, this kind of situation. So in this way, I we have to claim that's a wonderful life. But during that time, the prime minister, uh, his name is Wang Anshi. I think next year I will find time to uh, talk about him. All right. He started a reform, so-called the Xinyin reform. Okay. So uh, I think it's two, three weeks ago when I talk about this and the people start to ask why, what's the reason you need a reform, right? Why you need a reformation? If everything is, you know, the reason, the reason is basic is a financial problem, okay? Government deficit, okay? You can look at this situation, all right? Because the GPT is high, and then government had a lot of revenue from the tax. Okay, so that's all good. Okay, and the, the specialty of the Song Dynasty is Song Dynasty is a civil government. Okay, let's look at this one carefully because during that time we think about thousand years before, it's not that easy to have an idea have a civil government. That means the military, the general are not in the government. For example, the uh, the minister of defense, right, is not general; it's the regular civil, the scholar. Okay, so that's the difference. And then, in a way, it's very modern, just like today, right? In Amer American, the our defense, uh, the minister of the defense, what's his name? Austin. Okay, he used to be a general, but he has to retire, and he needs the Congress to approve. Otherwise, he cannot take this position. So in, so in this sense, uh, Chinese government is a civil government. The reason is uh, during the past 100 years, there were so many coups. So the emperor, the founder of Song Dynasty, think that's very important to uh, have a civil government. So that means the person who has the power of military cannot control the military, okay? He only can issue the command to the general in the field. Okay, so I think that's the way they do it. But you can think about that when the civil government, it caused a lot of problem, which means overstaffing, okay, and the bureaucracy and a lot of corruption, okay, during that time. But I think to look at around the world during that time, overstaffing, bureaucracy, corruption, probably the good considered com compared to Western Europe, probably that's a good situation because that means advanced, okay? And they also change their military service. Most of time in China is doing drafting, right? I think even in Europe still doing uh, drafting because if you need a war, you bring the people, the farmer and bring them, give them the weapon, ask them to fight, okay? But during that time, <clears throat> The Chinese government, and that's only happened during this time. The, they don't do the uh, drafting or conscription. Basically they do is perfect, just like American today. So basics, the military are lifetime. They got a lifetime pay, okay? So the situation is a lot of jobless, okay? They just join the military. So you will see the quality is not that good because if you are if you are smart, you can study, pass the civil examination, become the government official. If you are strong, you can work in the farm and you can live a nice nice life. And if you have no skill, then you just join the military. You got paid. Okay, I think that's the situation turned out to be, and which is a good situation. Because for many many years, all the revolution or rebellion happened. Because a lot of jobless, a lot of people have a famine, they have no food. So they start to reward, cause the social instability.
But this idea is pretty good because if you are hungry, you are nothing, just join the military. You got the pay, you got the, the, the good life. So it also stabilizes the society. Okay. And then think about it. Remember, they have the two powerful foreign country. Okay. And this kind of military is not going to not strong enough to defend the Song dynasty. So they got smart. Their idea is to pay tribute to Liao and the Western Xia. So only thing they, they just pay them money. Okay. So kind of the security guard, right? You pay the security guard. So to pay. so instead of fighting with them and the government decide to pay them. So that's the situation happened. And I think in today's situation in America, so the only problem happened is you have to spend a lot of money. So government have a lot of income, but they also spend a lot, but turn out they have a deficit. But in today's concept, we may say that's what's the problem, right? American have what, what kind of, uh, I, I don't remember how many uh, uh, deficit in rate, right? But we keep running. But at that time, people think that's terrible because we don't have enough money, okay? And that's probably the reason during that time. That's the first time in the history and probably the only time in China, ancient China, they have the paper money come out, okay? So I show here on the paper money, okay? It probably related to this reason because really don't have enough money. So the government is running on deficit, just like America, okay? So that's the situation. And that's why, you know, Wang Anshi is the prime minister. He tried to have a reform, okay, and to fix this problem. Uh, Joe, please. Just a quick question is, what was the primary means of exchange prior to paper money? Excuse me? The... What, what, did, what did they use in, instead of paper money prior to printing? Oh, 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 silver, silver. Chinese okay. always on the silver base, okay? Always on silver base. And uh, sometimes on the couple, uh, on the couple base, okay. So that that's always a tradition, even to the uh, uh, early night uh, to the nineteenth century, still use silver. And I think the situation, one side story is, I think when Mexico uh, had discovered a lot of uh, silver and caused a financial crisis in China because the China always short of silver. So silver is considered very expensive in China. Of course, gold are expensive, but it's too rare. And silver is a good uh, uh, currency. has been through two, almost 2,000 years. And the discovery of uh, uh, silver in Mexico caused the financial crisis in China. I think it's around eight, uh, 19th century, early 19th century. Okay. Oh, so wow. That, that, that's the, the, another uh subject popular subject economics uh economists like to study is that's the situation yeah so, thank you yeah okay so uh that's not today's so i just want to give some background so we will it will be easier to bring you to during this time uh the economic other uh, uh, uh scholarly world okay because i'm chinese <laughs> philosophy always tied to political. So you need to know some political background and then you will see uh, how Chinese philosophy makes sense during that time. Uh, Fred, please. In Chinese art, you have seen reference to the Southern Song period. Are there two Song periods? Or yes. One? Yeah, okay. Uh, I showed it that before. Okay, so the Northern Song dynasty Okay, if I go back to this picture, okay. Okay, I didn't show the Southern Song Dynasty, okay, in today's, but I showed it before. Okay, so that's the state, okay, so that's the Liao, that's Qidan, that's the uh, Western Xia. Western Xia survived for a long, long time. And this one later on being replaced by Manchurian. Okay, they are from kind of a Korean and this kind of area. So they are, this one becomes so-called Jin. And then Jin later invade China. So China has to move from here, that's the capital, move to here. So Jin dynasty occupied the most part of China. So this area, 
in Chinese historian called Southern Song, which lasts another three, 350 years. Okay, until Mongolian from the further north, they take over all this one and the China and the everything and the Europe, everything. So that's the history. So uh, Mongolian only occupied China for 100 years. Then Ming Dynasty kick out the Mongolian and then restore the Han or Chinese people's uh, dynasty. So I hope it's clear. Okay, so I apologize if you covered that last time. Oh no, don't worry. You know, it, it, I, 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 I think it's every time you know we will have a repeat this kind of thing, and that's good for everyone, even for myself. <laughs> okay, so uh, during this one, we will see that the situation, and then uh, that's need a reform because that's we will say common sense. Except today in America, we don't see that's common sense because. We just print more money, then everything worked. But uh, during that time, people know that's the problem. So government need more money. That's the issue. Okay, we need to resolve this. So Wang Anshi is a very uh, we I shall call him a great philosopher, great scholar, great politician. He start a new policy. Okay, so his ways is, is complex, but you know. But you can see a thousand years ago, and the, the problem right now is modern problem, right? So without technology, without the economic theory, and his solution is first, I just make it simple on these three things, but actually it has much more complicated. So first talk about the governmental law, because at the springtime, a lot of farmer, they are running out of the food. So they have no seed for next year's crop. All right. So for this reason, they have to sell their land or you know, sell themselves, okay, borrow the high interest loan to buy the seed and for the food so they can survive from the spring time and they can go to the next year. So one answer's idea is pretty simple. Because the government always store enough, enough food, because the food, the rice, used for uh, salary. So you just give the food for the farmer and the take 10% low uh, interest rate. So after they grow for the next year's crop, you just uh, take the money, uh, the uh, rice back and add the 10%. So government will have more money. Another thing they call it the, uh, the covey system, okay? Because during uh, most of time, I believe not only in China, also around the world, government, if you have some construction, you will uh, draft the people, right? The local people to do the work. And the one answer's idea is if you need to do so, you, because it's sometimes a cause problem, you know? Some people have no, some family only have one man, some family have 10 brothers, do they, if you say uh, 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 one man per family, kind of not fair. And some, so his idea is, okay, you can either send a people to work for government or you pay money. All right. So that's the idea. And then he also usually want to expand to build a more irrigation system. So a lot of bare land can be used to produce food and more food and the government can collect more money. So that's his idea to do it. And he's a pretty smart guy, practical guy. So he's, when he do it, he do it in a small area, kind of try out and it work. So he pushed to the entire country. But you can understand that during this situation because government official corruption and then there's no information system. You, you don't know what they are doing until three days later, okay, because the, there's no telecommunication. So it caused a lot of corruption, a lot of problem, because for example, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes the local government will force the farmer to borrow the law, okay, because government can make more money. All right. So there's a lot of problem happen here. And the major people, the people against Wang Anshi mostly are traditional Confucianism, Confucians. 
because they believe government should not make money from the people. Government is taking care of the people. So they have this kind of ideological uh, rival and rivalry and also have some critical problem between uh, uh, different people. Some are systematic problems and some are, uh, if I mean, some are systematic problems, some are um, people's problem. So it's not here to discuss whether how does this new policy work, okay? But uh, only thing I need to say is traditional historian, Chinese historian will say it failed, all right? But I think it's debatable because I believe their opinion is biased because most are Confucian, Confucian. So they say it failed. But in my opinion, personally, I don't see it fail. I see it work. And the, again, the reason are the same. The person says it's fail because you see, uh, just like Fred said, okay, then later on, right, you have the sovereign song because they're foreign invade, so you fail. And the way to say is, without this, the northern song dynasty will not last for 300 years. It probably crop immediately. So we don't know. History cannot repeat. We don't know. But again, the problem is this. Wang Anshi is the person do it. And during the time, another person is Sima Guang. And he is very famous for his uh, writing called, um, Chinese called Zhi Zhi Tong Jian. And then uh, English usually translate as Zhi Zhi Tong Jian or the meaning means comprehensive mirror in aid of government. Okay, so that's a history book from the uh, start from the warring state about 500, uh, 300 BC up to the current time. So that's over a thousand five hundred years history. So Sima Guang is the person who is tradition Orthodox or so-called orthodoxy uh, Confucian. He is strongly against Wang An's. So this can become a rival. So for the following history in a few hundred years, the situation has become new policy and against new policy. When the young emperor get the power, they were used because they are young. So they were, uh, well, usually they are very young. So their mother, the queen mother, were in charge. So Queen Mother will use the old policy. But when the young emperor grow up, seize the power, he will use the new policy to kick out the old policy. So that's become the political uh, uh, situation through the history for about 100 years. But in today's America, we probably will say, What's the deal, right? That's a two-party system, like in uh, England, England, right? They have the uh, Whig and the Tory, right? So fine, okay. But Chinese don't think they don't think this way. So, uh, but basically, that's a, become a two system. But today we are focused is this system, okay? And because the reason is a philosophical reason, uh, Sima Guang. Okay, after he died or when he kind of retired, he, the Sima Guang, this old system, break up to three system. One we call it the Su, okay, one called Su, one called Lu. Uh, the name uh, is a little bit complex. Okay, the name here means in the northern part, the area, uh, west part. Su is means on the Sichuan. Okay, if you go to the Sichuan food, okay, that's the area basically dominated by the Su 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 family. And today we will focus is on the Lu. Okay, that's we talked about for months. It's the five Confucian masters. Okay, so that's area, and they have some subtle difference. For example, um. Uh, uh, some are uh, uh, like law, okay? This school will focus on mentions. 
and uh, these <coughs> this school they don't think uh, uh measures are that important okay and uh, that this one and this one they all against uh, buddhism but the su school the su family they will adopt some uh, buddhism teaching uh, and taoism thinking so they are different but again we are talking about is here the this area, okay, only the uh, dual school, right? So this one become, the reason I talk about this is this one become the uh, orthodox of uh, Confucian uh, teacher, okay? So uh, I think during the last months, we all introduced about the uh, Sao Yong, Zhou Dun Yi, and the Zhang Zai. I put this one on the top first, they are older. Uh, they consider the first generation, <clears throat> Secondary, these three, Sao Yong, Zhou Dun Yi, and Zhang Zai, and they all talking about the cosmology. Because we will know in Confucian teaching, uh, Confucius is very, um, this world, okay, they deal with this world, not care about the other world. So for thousand years, Confucius lack of cosmology, okay, uh, metaphysical, uh, this kind of concept. So after the in, during, in the eighth century, the Tang Dynasty, the Buddhism come to China and Buddhism uh, from India, right? So have a strong cosmo uh, cosmology thinking, metaphysical thinking, logical thinking, which become dominate in China. So the Chinese philosopher, Chinese scholar try to bring their own philosophy. So they go dig through the ancient texts, okay? So they had a different idea, go to the books of change, uh, go to the five element, and the Zhang Zai is talking about qi, okay? I think we talked about this before. So that's all built the uh, cosmology or metaphysical foundation, okay? So Zhou Dun Yi had a student with a brother, Chen Hao and Chen Yi. And we talk about Chen Hao uh, last month, and he's focused on the heart mind, and the Chen Yi is going to focus on the uh, so-called universal principle. Okay, so that's the two uh, school we have uh, uh, talked about here. So before I go further, okay, I will just give a brief review on the history of Chinese, uh, of the Confucian, okay? Uh, uh, a brief history, I call it a brief history of Confucian. Okay. So uh, just like when we talk about the history of uh, Christian, right? Christianity, right? It, it, we should know from the St. Paul, uh, uh, St. Augustine, uh, Gregory the Great, uh, John the Scott, uh, Thomas Aquinas, the uh, Franciscan, and the uh, Reformation, all belong to Christianity. But they have the different thinking, right? There's no reason to say uh, uh, Gregory, uh, the, uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas and uh, St. Augustine are the same. They are different, right? Even they all, the same. same situation. For 2000 years, Confucianism has been through many, many different change, okay? Um, so, uh, so I just bring a quick review on this one. So before the time, before Confucius time, we call it the rule tradition, basics. That is the teaching of the learned people, government official, how to behave. Okay, that's so-called rule condition. Then about the 500 to 300 BC, that's Chinese, the warring state and spring and the autumn, that's the uh, Confucius and the Mencius teaching. That's the way we, today we read the Confucius Anodex or Mencius. Okay, that's the teaching. And in the Han Dynasty, that's about 100 BC, a person called Dong Zhongshu, okay, they have, he has his own idea about the human heaven, okay. Then in the Tang Dynasty, they have Han Yu, and his purpose is bring back the uh, Confucius, Confucian teaching from the uh, Buddhism teaching. Okay. 
Okay, so that's his idea. And today we are talking about is five Confucian masters in the Northern Song Dynasty. And the next year we will start from the Southern Song Dynasty, which is Zhu Xi, that's the most famous, I probably will call him the godfather of Confucianism because today's Confucian is defined by him. Okay, so then we will move on to Wang Yangmin and Yun. So that's all the Confucians and uh, Confucianism change uh, through the history. And uh, this one is just a quick review on the cosmology because um, during the before time, uh, about 200 BC in the Han Dynasty, uh, people constantly about the cosmology, people constantly talk about is heaven, earth, and the man, and heaven, human interaction. This kind of uh, cosmology is very primary, right? You, you just talk about heaven and the human interaction. There's not much philosophy or uh, metaphysics is uh, talking about. It's, it's weak, let's put this way. So in the Northern Song Dynasty, the uh, people I just introduced, Shao Yong, Zhou Dunyi, Zhang Zai, they start to build, okay, based on the book of change. Okay, they start to build different idea about uh, uh, cosmology. So Zhang Zai started the Qi base. And today the, uh, the subject is uh, Chen Yi, and he's going to so-called the universal uh, principle. So that's the way I kind of serve as the background. Why we bring up the universal principle, or so-called the Di base cosmology uh, in today's subject. So that's the uh, first part of today's presentation. And then I will pause for one minute if you have a question, comment, or uh, I hope it makes sense to bring you to the next subject. No question, okay. So the second part that we talk about the universal principle. Okay, so first let's understand the word, okay. In Chinese, this school, uh, uh, people call Li Xue, okay, that's the word, Li, okay. That's the word, Li, we are talking about this one, okay. So, if you want to understand this word, I just collect all different kinds of combination of the because the two character you can combine and become a, a, a term, right? So for example, I'm not going to psychology, okay? When Chinese call psychology, Chinese call xin li, that means universal principle of heart mind, okay? So that's the psychology. If you talk about universal principle of cooking stuff, that means liao li, that means the cuisine or cooking. So if you talk about, the, let's say physics, okay, that means the universal principle of things, okay, wu li, okay, so you can see everything with li. So this word li has been used as a, Principle, reason, uh, law. Okay. So funny thing like haircut, Chinese called Li Fa, they mean make your hair become Li, which is universal principle. So uh, even this word, you will see, uh, if you see this table, okay, you probably, I hope you will get an idea what's the meaning of this word Li. So that's, but I decide to translate this word to universal principle. They have many different kinds of trans, uh, translation, okay? So I'm get through a little bit uh, technique on the translation here. So in Chinese, there's no doubt there's only one name to call this school, all right? Which is also Dax uh, Confucian school. Uh, Chinese call Li Xue, Xue means school and the D. So some people will say, uh, some people will say, okay, how about just use the D? 
But again, if you are familiar with another word, it's also called the, that means rituals. So uh, if you, some, sometimes you call the xie or school of the, it's confusing because this the is different than <laughs> rituals. And that's related to pronunciation because in the ancient Chinese pronunciation is different pronunciation but in today's pronunciation are the same. Technically, we should not call the rituals as the, we should call they, okay? So L-E, not L-I, but people already call it L-I. So, you know, that become very difficult to find another name to call this school. So I think school of the universal principle probably makes sense. But I just want to list all other uh, translation because they, when you read other articles, some will call universal principle and some will call the xue. Some will call transcendental principle or some will call principle with capital P, just to make sure they write the capital P. Some will call school of reason with capital R or school of the universal law rationalistic school, okay? Or sometimes they call Chen Zhu school because the Chen brother, okay? And the Zhu Xi in the later time, they are focused, promote, uh, focus on this uh, philosophy. That's why uh, uh, they have so many different names. So that involves the different names. Um, Joe, please. Yeah, how did how are they defining transcendental in that particular instance? Um, yeah, that's the problem. That's why I disagree. Use the transcendental principle because they the, the all these names are invented by Western scholar, right? Because of when the Western scholar look at this word the right. Mm -hmm. They have to find the matching English word with to explain. So if you, that's why I this this one, right? So I think the reason they use transcendental, okay, is they don't want they want to separate from the regular principle. Okay, so they are thinking about they have the one imaginary principle over there somewhere on, on the heaven, okay, which we cannot touch, but we can try to understand this one. I will show this one later. I glad that you asked this question because most of scholars will consider he is, this school is a, pl a platonic school idea. For, yeah, that's what okay. I was thinking. Yeah, yes, doesn't... because most scholars will say that's the Platonic philosophy, okay? Because if you put this way, it's very close. And if you through the Chinese history, philosophy development, you may find out the interesting is kind of reverse from the Western. Because the Chinese start from political, social, and all the way at the southern years, start to talking about metaphysic idea form, this kind of principle, law, this kind of thing. Unlike in the Western development, we start from Plato and all the way more to uh, social psychology and you know, all this kind of thing. So it, it's interesting we find out the development is the reverse. So when I talk about in the early of this year, when I talk about Chinese philosophy, feel like the Chinese philosophy always advanced hundreds, thousand years than the Western development because before Benjamin Johnson, okay, uh, Chinese already talk about the uh, reward, the punishment, you know, uh, utilitarian, all this one, okay. But Chinese never talk about this kind of ideal form, you know, metaphysic, ontological uh, idea until this time, okay. But who, that idea has been talk, discussed for thousand years in Europe. So, Back to the person, okay, two brothers, right? So today we focus on this one, the younger brother. So 
uh, interesting thing is you can compare these two person, right? So they are brothers only one year apart. And then uh, I talk about this one last time, uh, the older brother, he passed the imperial examination and get the political job, okay? Get a job in the central government. Unfortunately, the younger brother didn't pass. So he worked for his older brother. And then their personality, you can see they are different. All right. uh, the older brother, uh, people describe him as he can sit all day long like a statue. He was very warm and uh, affable when receiving people. So he's a, I think I last, uh, last time I also introduced his, uh, some of his point, his writing, he shows his uh, idea of uh, happiness and uh, his view is more relaxed kind of people. His younger brother, you will see, is much more serious. Very famous thing is so-called Chinese called Cheng Men Li Xue. That means standing, I just translated as standing in the snow in front of the door of Cheng, okay? Because they have the talking about the incident when two men requesting to be taken on his disciples. He, they have to stood in the snow for hours at the door and become Renounce the example of a Confucian virtue of devotion to learning and the respect for their masters. So that's a famous thing. And another thing I think probably will disappoint many people uh, is his philosophy okay, eventually become so-called uh, widow chastity. Okay, So that means if the husband died, you should not remarry. You should keep your chastity, okay? So that's become this, okay? And that's a big question. We will talk about this, you know, how come a universal principle or you call the ontological principle will go to this kind of thing. His famous saying, okay, is to starve to death is a small matter but to lose one's chastity is a great matter, okay? So this, this word has, I don't know what situation Cheng Yi talk about this, okay? I think in the account is some people ask, okay? If a widow uh, cannot survive, can she remarry? And that's his answer, but we don't know the account, okay? But later on in Zhu Xi, consider this one is important. And this, this um, principle has been practiced for a long time for the following thousand years, a thousand years been doing this way. So uh, I think to make it simple to talk about this is chastity is about principle, the universal principle. And then the starving to death, that means you desire for food or sex, okay, is your human desire. So human desire is not that important. Importance is universal principle. So they will go to this kind of, you know, when you practice, go to this one. But we should not be so surprised on the situation if just like Joe asked about, you know, it's very similar to Platonic. Uh, Plato talked about the idea form, right? He talked about they had a form, okay, we don't know where is the form, but we can say in God's might or somewhere in the heaven, we don't know. Because what we see is in the cave, uh, based on the allegory of cave. What we see is just opinion, which is not rule. And then you have to go to the realm of form, then you will know the truth, okay. If you compare to Cheng Yi's philosophy, it's very similar to whatever you learn here or the principle of things, turn out that you have to, you know, they have the higher universal, universal principle somewhere. And you were not so surprised, you know, <coughs> when the uh, Cheng Yi later on talking about the, the so-called uh, uh, widow chastity, right? And if you look at the Plato's uh, Republic, right? He talked about philosophy king 
and totally against uh, democracy and become very cool. Well, some people think it's utopian, but in a way it's very, uh, the three deal of society, philosophy, kin, you know, all these kinds of, in my opinion, terrible things happen. Okay, so uh, probably we should not be so surprised. You know, this kind of philosophy, uh, in a way it's good, in a way it probably has some uh, surprise result. And this one is another way to show how uh, Chen Yi and the Plato's philosophy are in a similar way, right? Uh, in Plato's idea, how do you know that uh, in the real world it's an apple? How do you know it's an apple? You know, some are green, some big, some small, some sour, some sweet. And because they have ideal, ideal apple somewhere, so you know. Same as uh, Chen Yi's uh, philosophy. Okay, he's talking about the thing in this world, right? Is everything is like is made of qi? Okay, qi is the 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 the, the material cause all the tangible things, and they all follow the universal principle. So in a way, it's universal prior to particular, just like a form prior to things, okay? So the same principle will apply to both nature and the human. So in this way, human nature is the universal principle, okay? Unlike his older brother talking about the human heart mind is the principle. So that's the, the, the subtle difference start to separate from his brother. And last time, I think we, a lot of people start to uh, ask a question about the metaphysics in China. So this metaphysic concept in Chinese world, Chinese, how people sometimes ask how does Chinese, in today's Chinese, uh, how do you translate metaphysic? In Chinese, we call in the world called Xing or Sa, that means metaphysic. It's very similar to Aristotle's. When we talk about Aristotle, right? We know Aristotle has many, many books, okay? And uh, we know his book called Physics, the book called Metaphysics, right? So what's the difference between physics and the metaphysics, okay? So uh, th that's a easy thing to talk about, physics is thing, here, right? You talk about Newton's law, uh, gravity, uh, chemi chem uh, uh, chemical reaction, they all physics, okay? And environmental science, they all physics. And the, the, the thing beyond this, talk about God, soul, okay, religion, belief, uh, 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 they all metaphysics. So that's the way Aristotle separate. I don't, I don't think Aristotle has this separation, but in the Western, when they discover Aristotle's physics, and after that, they have appendix, right? Uh, uh, other writing, which is different than his physics, and the scholar call him metaphysic. And that's the thing defined today we call metaphysics in English. But in China, during that time, Chen Yi, go back to ancient uh, book of change, Okay, which is very old book. And in the one chapter, the book said Chinese read as Xing Er Sang with Dao Qing Er Xia Zi with Qi. Okay. So translation is above the form. Okay, this form is different than I think the form may not be the good translation because it will confuse with a Platonic form. But above form, above the shape, tangible, we call Dao. Below the form, we call vessel. So Chen Yi's explanation, interpretation is Tao is the universal principle, which in Chinese called the, and in English, we shall call metaphysic. So in another way, just nobody used this way. It could be very fair to call this school a metaphysical school of Confucianism. Okay, So uh, that's uh, Chen Yi's and when they talk about qi, okay, that means vessel, 
okay, but also imply every, everything tangible. So everything tangible is the formation of qi, which his brother, uh, uh, Zhang Zai is talking about because uh, like qi gong or this kind, of, that's a physics. So Cheng Yi start to separate on the philosophical world. He start to separate the metaphysical and the physical, okay? So that's his idea on the metaphysical world. And that's his very beginning of uh, philosophy and which I will consider his great contribution in uh, Chinese philosophy. Yeah. So uh, I think I will finish this one. Yeah, finish this one before I go to the ontological argument uh, of Cheng Yi. So I will pause for a few minutes one minute if you have a question or you have uh, something, uh, some thought you want to share. <clears throat> I hope the uh, uh, his idea about the Plato, compare him with Plato, that's not just my feeling. You know, I think uh, like Joe probably already have this kind of feeling. And if you search in the internet, most of scholar will call him a uh, Platonic. And in the later time, next year, I'm going to talk about Zhu Xi. Uh, on the book I follow, uh, Feng Yulan's uh, Short History of the Chinese Philosophy. Basics will be, I think the title he call is, I think he called the Platonic Idea of uh, Confucianism. So, like, uh, so it's no surprise, you know, uh, ev everyone who read uh, Plato or Western philosophy and then uh, read the Cheng Yi philosophy will find out it's uh, not, should not be so surprising, but they are very similar okay, idea. Okay. So I'm going to move on if you have no question, no comment. Okay, that's Cheng Yi's ontological argument. Okay, so let's put it this way. Okay, I know Joe have a lot of concern on the ontological argument. <laughs> okay, so uh, first I have to declare I didn't invent okay, his philosophy. Uh, I, not myself call him ontological. It's kind of a consensus. Okay, uh, uh, most of scholar, in, uh, both Western scholar and the Chinese scholar call him ontological. Uh, argument, his argument is ontological argument. About what? About the human nature, okay? So in the, how do you say that? Okay, so let's put it this way. I just summarize his writing, put this way, his ontological argument. We can say all things are made of qi, okay? Qi, what is qi? That's a big question. And we talked about, about probably two months ago, okay? Qi, what is qi, right? Uh, today we probably all kind of know qi, uh, air, uh, qi gong, okay, this kind of thing, okay. So everything is made of qi, okay. And here's the key difference. Qi follow the principle, okay, which is different than, let's say 50, 100 years ago, uh, another philosopher, Zhang Zai, he will argue what qi act we call principle, all right? But here, Cheng Yi is reversed. He said qi is controlled by universal principle. The, the idea that's the key difference, okay? In this way, we start to call him ontological argument because this principle, the, or you want to call it the universal principle, heaven, Nature world, human nature are all follow the same principle. That's the the, the world I introduced at the beginning. This Chinese word the okay. So this universal principle, what we call the is the Tao, which is good. All right. So in this way, he argued human nature is good. Okay. Let's make it about the human, just like. Um, uh, in the Western philosophy, people kind of always try to prove the existence of God, free will, and talk about the immortality of soul. 
And the Chinese philosophy for thousand years, people like to discuss human nature. Okay. Uh, just give a quick uh, review, right? In a long time ago, uh, Meng Zi mentions, uh, suggests, or not suggests, argue human nature is good. And another Confucian scholar, Xun Zi, argue human nature is bad. Okay. So we need uh, richer education to correct the human nature. So that's the argument for a long time. But after, I think it's after 100 years, you know, people all agree human nature is good. Okay, so human nature is bad. People don't talk about this anymore because they will go to the legalism and legalism is uh, terrible according to Confucian uh, scholar. So forget about human nature is bad because human nature is bad will lead to legalism and legalism is terrible. Okay, that, I'm not saying I agree, I just say, that's a Confucian scholar will talk or think this way. So since human nature is good, and then we have the problem, right? Just like uh, in the Christian, we'll say God is benevolence, it's all good, you know, it's the best of the best. And where is the evil coming from, right? So that's a big question. Same as human nature is good. And where's the bad people coming from, right? We If we agree human nature is good, then but not everybody are good people, right? They have a lot of bad people, we all know, right? So where's the evil coming from? Just like in the Western philosophy, the God is all good, all nice, you know, but where's the evil coming from? Same question happened here. So I just make a chart here. So let's make it simple, okay? In the mentions and the Zhang Zai, they all talk about Qi, they are Qi based. So when they talk about human nature is good, the good nature, the, the goodness is the nature, okay? It's a naturally good. So how are we going to do the moral cultivation? How can you, you know, keep your goodness, right? Mencius is can because Mencius and Zhang Zai, basics, they consider the qi is, because they are qi based, qi is kind of organic thing. So it will naturally grow. So uh, I've been talking about this, you know, the, we talk about the uh, mentions talking about the uh, four seeds, right? Yeah, just like a seed, so you need to nurture and then you will grow. And where's the bad people? Because the environment, right? He talk about water always, always going down. But if you, you know, treat the water, water can go to your head. Right, you can push the one. So the outside force will make the bad people, make people bad. So naturally, people, uh, he calls the human nature is good, just like water flowing up. Okay, why water going up? Because outside force make it go up. So that's Mencius' argument. He has a reason to argue this. Okay, and uh, Chen Hao is Chen Yi's brother because he is a hot mind based. Base. So his goodness basis is a psychological good. All right. So he would like to talk about the, because everything is uh, psychological, you talk about you should maintain your qi, okay? The bad qi, okay, will cause the, uh, uh, make the bad people. So qi could be good, it could be bad, all right? So that's your psychological. And then what he focused on moral cultivation and we discussed last time, his argument on the moral cultivation is very weak because basically he didn't touch on how to make you good. Uh, he only thing he talked about a lot is calm down, okay? Because I think the example he is using is when you see a person, a kid drop to the well, to the water, right? You never think about it. You just jump to save the kids. That's your good chi will do it without think twice because you never think about like, ah, if I don't save the kids, people will blame on me. Or if I save the kids, kids, I will be a hero and people will praise me and his parents probably will give me some money. You never think about this because you, that's your nature, you just do it, okay? So if you think through, sometimes you will do bad thing, okay? 
So that's his idea. So he was saying meditation is important. Today we talk about Chen Yi. So he's more mature argument because scholar all agree. He bring the human nature good to the ontological level. Right? Uh, that means he talk about the principle that because the human nature is following the universal principle. And the universal principle is Tao, and the Tao is good. Okay. So where's the bad people coming from? Because the human nature, human desire, he doesn't want to call it nature, human desire are bad. You desire for food, for sex, for money, for social ranking, for comfortableness, and for a lot of the things. That's human desire, that's bad. The good thing is your principle is good. So in this way, his uh, moral cultivation is much stronger, much, uh, uh, much practical in this way. I will talk about in the next sec uh, in, uh, in the next part is moral cultivation. That's why, that's one of the reasons he become orthodoxy because it's easy to implant his friends. So he talked about the knowledge to study, experience, talk about respectfulness, talk about sincerity. So he has a step-by-step -step, a way to do the moral cultivation. Uh, Joe, please. Yeah, I did just, I was just doing a quick comment. I mean, it, I like the idea that you're talking about the practicality of it, because it almost reminds me of a kind of a stoic approach where you're yeah. looking yeah. at the basics of your desires and then your knowledge and study and your experience and your ability to apply reason is your ability to control your desires. And those are, there are universal principles, which are virtue is the only good in that particular instance, but it's a very similar um, practical way of looking at the, the world. Anyway, that's just a, yeah, it's a very, that's just a comment. Very yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, any other comment, suggestion, or question, or anything you want to share? Uh, Sebastian? Yeah. Uh, I, I know we're putting this, this thought of desire aside and making it um, a human, a human uh, reaction or action, but isn't it is it the desire that we have to follow the, the way or the Tao? Isn't that a desire? No, it's not desire. <laughs> All right. If it's not a desire, then is it something that we're born with? In other words, is it apart from if it's supposed to be nature and we are now human or human nature, then it goes somehow to say, if I want to follow something, I have a reason to follow it, a purpose to follow it. And if you do, you if you go away from it, um, I guess the word desire bothers me in, in that I don't understand what they mean by desire. It does it mean a, a longing for, or is it, does it mean something that I have to attain? Um, I think that's where I, I got lost. Yeah, okay. I think that that's always a problem uh, when the Western look at the Chinese talk about desire, I, I just have to make a very rough distinction. Desire is bad in Chinese, okay? That's put this way. They put the words called yu, okay? That's all bad. Sex is bad. Food is bad, okay? Looking for wealth is bad. Looking for ranking is bad. They all bad. So what's the good? Good is the principle. So you don't desire to follow the principle. You cultivate moral cultivation then your mind will automatically go to the principle, the universal principle, okay? So we talk about the, the extent, extending your knowledge, investigating of things, with respectfulness, sincere in your mind, okay? We will talk about in the next part, we will talk about the so-called great learning. That's the way to cultivate. It's not a desire. And you may say, oh, that's the desire because I have to, uh, yeah, but unfortunately, uh, Chinese word desire, yu, probably doesn't mean this one, okay? You have to kind of separate down 
for example, the kids uh, are, are, are about to drop to the river or whale, right? You will jump to save the kids. You don't have the desire to save the kids. You don't do the calculation. Then you save the kids. Say, mm, maybe he is his father, probably not a good guy, you know, and you know, and, uh, that's his point. So you don't think about this. No, you just do the jump. And how, why you are doing this? Because you have this kind of quality, right? Sincere, sincerity, respectfulness, you know, all this kind of thing. So that's the way you are talking about. <laughs> So it's basically a choice. Do you, you can say choice? it's a choice, yeah. Okay. You can say it's a choice. Okay, yeah. okay. thank yeah. you. Yeah. So bring this one, because I've seen talking this one, I find out it's a very surprising coincidence, okay? St. Anson, okay? He was born in the exactly the same year as Cheng Yi, okay? And that he died two years later than Cheng Yi. Both of them lived for a long time. Both of these two great, we should call great, I'm not sure, okay, scholar, they all been called by the philosophers ontological argument. Cheng Yi being called the ontological argument of human nature is good. And then Saint Anson being called ontological argument of the existence of God, right? So uh, I don't want to go to the detail on St. Anson's argument, but basically his argument is that God is uh, a being uh, beyond which no greater can be imagined. So some fool, he based on the uh, Bible, Old Testament, uh, some, right? The fool say God's only, there's no God. God only exists an idea in mind. And since you have the God in your idea in mind, you can imagine God in your idea and as well as in reality. In this kind of thinking is greater than God only in your mind. So for this reason, God exists. Okay. So that's his argument. Uh, same answer argument, and we call it ontological argument. So in another way, same answer talking about God as the being itself, not a kind of being. So similarly, I'm not talking about just kind of uh, uh, use as a metaphor. Or the <laughs> Cheng Yi's argument, human nature is kind, of, is kind of the same flavor, talking about the principle, there's a principle, universal principle, which is Tao, which is, is good. Okay, so that's the argument. So I don't know if you want to go a little bit more on this or not, but basics, that's the, these two person, they were born in the same year, one in, St. Anson is from England, right? He's uh, yeah, England, right? yeah, Oxford, I think. So, uh, but you may surprise, okay? Their purpose is searching for happiness, okay? Even they have the so-called uh, widow chastity, <laughs> but the purpose they talk a lot is searching for happiness, okay? So probably you will, I, I think we were in the, uh, 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 every Tuesday we have the Confucius Analect uh, reading. We read chapter by chapter. Okay, I think we already read these two from book six and the book seven. These two are very famous and uh, the Cheng brothers are uh, talking about this. Okay, so uh, book six, uh, chapter 11, okay. Confucius said, the master said, how worthy is Hui? Hui is his uh, best student, right? Okay with a bowl of food, a cup of drink, and living in a mean narrow den, while others could not bear this misery. Hui, okay, his student, never change his joy of study. How worthy is Hui? That's how Confucius praised okay, his student. So in this argument, Hui, Yan Hui is searching for happiness, but he is not 
searching for food, more food, you know, drinking a lot, you know, sex, whatever, the main live in the mansion. No, he studied, okay. He lived in a poor neighborhood. He only need one bowl of food, a cup of drink, that means water. Oh, that's enough, but he happy. Okay. Confucius himself also said, the master said, eating coarse food, drinking water, and sleeping on my bent arm as a pillow. There too are joys in them. Riches and high ranking without righteousness are to me like a floating cloud. So Confucius also talked about the same thing for himself. He is not looking for riches and the high ranking without, you know, he doesn't want, he is more uh, political, you know. He just said without the righteousness. Okay. So uh, I, I'm going to skip the last part. It's a little bit uh, complex. Okay. But basics, you, we use this tool as an example, right? You will see their purpose is searching for happiness. Okay. But their happiness is just back to Sebastian's question, right? The desire, they don't desire the food, the drink, the house, right? They, but they enjoy their life of study. And in this way, why they are studying? They are studying to understand the universal principles. So I will pause here okay, for a moment before I go to the last part of today's section and which is talking about the moral cultivation. So any question, comment? Or... Okay, so uh, let's go to the next part. So last time I talked about the, <laughs> okay, put this way, okay. I think Cheng Yi is very important. Uh, another reason is he kind of complete the Confucian philosophy as a philosophy, a complete philosophy. When we read the ancient uh, philosopher, uh, uh, ancient texts like Anadex or Mencius, it's not uh, in a way, it's not a complete philosophy, right? Because Anadex just talk about do this, don't do that, I did this, mentions a lot of the debate, argument, you know, it's, it's different, okay? In the Western philosophy, you can go to ancient like Plato, Aristotle, you know, they all cover like epistemology, ethic, metaphysic. That's kind of we general agree that uh, philosophy should be. But uh, these three fields is not my invention. It's common in the Chinese scholar. We'll talk about Chinese philosophy. The, 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 the field they will talk about is ontology, ontology moral cultivation, and the theory of rain. Okay, this three kinds of field. So last week, uh, last month, we talked about uh, Chen Yi's older brother, Chen Hao. He's talking about the my heart. Only thing he talked about is in this area, the theory of rain. He talking about everybody have this kind of heart can reach the sagehood. So sage is no different than myself. We are the same. Only thing is you need to go back to your heart. That's his brother. So it's a great philosophy, but the situation is, I think last time we, I faced a lot of questions. People start to ask me, how? You say you are the same as the sage. How am I going to do this way, right? Uh, he didn't talk, talk very clear, only say, calm down, go back to your mind. So it turned out that he did a lot of meditation. So basics, his young older brother's philosophy, even he reject the Buddhism teaching, but basically he borrowed the Buddhist, Buddhist, 
Buddhism idea, right? Meditation, that's the thing he followed. In the Buddha's teaching, everybody can become a Buddha, okay? So he, he just swapped the term, right, from Buddha to the sage. Everyone can be the sage, okay? So his older brother just talking about the great idea, you know, you can do it, but he didn't tell you how to do it. And Chen Yi, his younger brother, living 24 years after his death, had the room to further develop the philosophy. So ontological argument we talked about already, we talk about human nature, he bring the human nature is good to the ontological uh, uh, level on that. So, and uh, right now we are going to talk about his most important part is the moral cultivation he is talking about. So I don't know, is anyone here on the first section in uh, this year? When we talk about great learning? No one here, no, no one was here. Nobody, probably nobody remember. That's right. Joe, are you here? <laughs> okay. Uh, but I don't a, think so. Yeah, there's a, uh, uh, last about uh, this year, this year, uh, 2022. When I started, I talk, I, I just randomly pick. I just decided, you know, we probably use something uh, traditional text to read. So I pick the great learning. So we read the great learning for the whole section. So it's great today. It's the uh, last section for 2022. We are going to end with the great learning. Okay. Because this text is Chen Yi bring up for the moral cultivation. Okay. So basically he talked about three things important. Okay. Living with respectfulness. So he talked about living with respectfulness is one of the most important way for cultivating the mind in order to conform with the universal principles. Respectfulness appears in analects as the attitude one assumes toward the parent, ruler, spirit, it includes both emotion, reverence, and the state of self-possession, self uh, attentiveness, and concentration. That's the personal cultivation, personal training you need to do on your mind. Then you talk about investigating things since for every event or everything, there is a particular principle. So one should investigate each event or each thing in order to comprehend its principle. So you look at this one, okay, and then I'm going to read the next one. Then extending knowledge to achieve the ultimate goal of a Pre, uh, apprehending the universal principle. You need to understand the universal principle. One should extend one's knowledge by investigating matters or investigating things. So he start he, from here, from this three simple, I just pick up three most important of his teaching. You will see uh, it's different than other, uh, than his, especially his older brother. It's very, Critical, you know what to do, okay? You need to be calm down, be respectful, okay? To your senior, rural, parents, siblings, you know, all this kind of thing. You need to investigate in things. You need to understand it. You need to improve your knowledge, okay? So, Put this way, if you have to compare, if you're familiar with Buddhism teaching or Zen Buddhism, people come and talk about is the sudden enlightenment and the gradual enlightenment. Satori, okay, the two kinds of enlightenment. You just, aha, I got it, right? Same as this situation. His older brother is sudden enlightenment to reach the sagehood. And the younger brother, Chen Yi is talking about the gradual enlightenment, gradual understand, gradually reach the sagehood. So you need to do the step-by-step -step thinking. So, so that's the thing he is talking about. And based on this philosophy, he bring up the ancient text. And this text become important. Uh, so famous so-called uh, 
啊，大学哦 ，the great learning which we read word by word at the beginning of 2022. Okay, if you um uh you still can, I think I put in the uh in the uh video. Okay. And then you can uh, uh, see it if you go to the video. Right. So it's uh, famously in the uh, Chinese in, uh, uh, tradition, there's a four class book, uh, Analek, uh, Mencius, uh, the, the Doctrine of the Mean, and uh, Da Xue, the Great Learning. So that's one of the four must read book in the Confucian. Uh, teaching. Okay, so it's very short, and then it was written by. We don't know the or, or the author. It could be Confucius, the youngest uh, disciple, Zheng Shen, Zheng Zi, or could be the Confucius' the grandson, Zi Shi. Okay, who wrote this one? It's being considered as the beginning beginner's handbook. So you want to learn Confucius? That's the one. The first thing you need to learn. That's why I pick as the first reading in 2022. Okay, January 15, I think I start this one. And then it's on this very short. That's why we can read and dissect each word uh, in, a, uh, in two hours. Uh, it only had 1,100 characters. And I print out it's about two pages in the uh, legal size. And then it's just a uh, uh, step by step is from the uh, self cultivation to self perfection, you know, to utopia. And actually, most of part are commentary. Okay. And if you only read the text, only had the 200 characters. So, in this way, uh, all Chinese uh, or good students should be able to memorize. Well, I think uh, in the old generation, they probably can memorize. Uh, 200 characters is nothing. You know, so for, for the people who went into that. So I'm not going to read the all of thing, but I just want to bring the subject on this. Okay. Talk about eight steps. Okay. So in Chinese, we can Okay. So that's like like a mantra. Okay. So you just have to so in English, I, that's I try to translate. Okay. Investigating things, extending knowledge, making intention sincere, okay. rectifying one's own heart, refining oneself, harmonizing one's family, governing the state, pacify the world. Okay, that's from the beginning from the investigating things all the way through to pacify the world. So you have the international responsibility to the in well, of course, during that time, the Chinese scholars, Confucian talk about the world, they talk about China, but basically talk about the your known world. From the small things to your heart, to your body, to your family, to your state and to the entire world. So that's the teaching. And they, um, usually people will read this one and then uh, uh, the, the, the writing is interesting. One of the reasons I bring this one is the logic is very interesting because you go from the small to the big and then from the big to small, just like reading a mantra. Um, um, this one, but I will make it uh, simple as the last, then we will have some time we can uh, discuss. So I'm going to read the main part on this one in English. Okay, so, uh, so basics, let's understand the A step, right? The first step, the investigating things, extending knowledge, making intention clear, uh, uh, sincere, rectifying your heart, mind, Refining oneself, harmonizing your family, governing the state, pacify in the world. So that's a step by step. But you may ask, you know, what each one means. Then that's another question we should discuss. And another thing you might ask is, 
do I have to finish the step one, then go to step two, and finish step two, then go to step three? Or it's working on simultaneously. We don't know because the logic is very confusing in this way. But I'm going to read it, then you will find out. Okay, uh, Jim, please. So this is very, I, I had read a quote, and I guess it may not be accurate then um, from Confucius that says, to put the world in order, we must first put the nation in order. Uh, to put the nation in order, we must first put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must first cultivate our own personal life. Uh, we must first set our hearts right. Yes. So, so very. So, so this is neo Confucius. Then it's no, not. No, Confucius. No, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's put this way. First, Confucius didn't say this. Okay. You can read it in the end of that. Okay. Confucius' grandson or Confucius' the youngest disciple, Zheng Shen, wrote this text, okay. which is about. 500 BC, right? About that time, right? This text is existing for thousand years, but during this time, Chen Yi bring up, okay? They say, okay, that's what I say. We need to understand all the Chinese, uh, especially Confucian scholars, except the Wang An Shi, who is different, okay? Uh, who do the reform. That's why Chinese, Political is hardly have a radical reform because everything, even you have a new idea, they try to dig through the old text to say, hey, you see, they talk about this. Mencius was writing a long time ago, 300 BC, but people know it, people read it, but never think that's that important like today. Because during the, uh, I think his old uh, Zhang Zai, right? Zhang Zai, it, he talked about qi. He started to bring Mencius in, say, Mencius talk about qi, talk about this one, right? So Mencius become important, okay? And then uh, in this time, we talk about Cheng Yi. He talk about, he has ontological argument, which about human nature is good, which is match with Mencius. And Mencius has been bring up to the table. That's fine. And then right now he talking about moral cultivation. All right. So he talk about these things. That's his word. Living with respecting, investigating, and station knowledge. Then he talk about, see, in the ancient text, the book of rituals, okay? This chapter talking about this exactly like what I'm talking about. That's what we need to follow. So we don't know. He read this first, then talk about his philosophy. Or he has this philosophy first, then go dig through the old text. We don't know. But basics, that's he talking about. So uh, to answer your question, yes, this text exists long time ago, but never been put in today's uh, situation until his time. And then it's more strictly talking about is uh, 200 years later, I will cover Zhu Xi okay, uh, in the Southern Song Dynasty. He start to combine Analex, Mencius, Great Learning, Doctrine of, of Means together as a so-called four books. Then this one become a standard. So today you go to everywhere, including Korea, Japan. He has a, oh, what's the most important book of Confucius? They will tell you these four books. Okay. Everybody know. Okay. Just like you talk about Bible, you always have the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, you, you will not bring other book. So that's it. So uh, Fred, please. Thank you. Uh, Fred, please. When we had discussed uh, Mencius, Oh, quite a while ago. <clears throat> I remember the subject there was heart-mind, sort of a unification of heart and mind, right? Heart-mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when it talks about rectifying their hearts here, is that the same as, as what Mencius was talking about with the heart-mind? In other words, what, what, how am I, how should we take uh, rectifying our hearts. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. First, the heart, mind are the same words, and I believe they all mean the same thing. That's your heart, mind. Okay. Whatever you want to believe, that's a heart, mind. Okay. Which control your life. Mencius didn't talk about rectifying your heart mind. Mencius talk about nurture your heart. Okay, he talk about, he call about your, pursue your heart, okay? Your heart is go loose, you have to bring back. That's Mencius is talking about. This text is talking about rectifying, Make it correct if I want to make it uh, make it correct. So remember, this text is written before Mencius, right? It's written about fifty years after Confucius' death. Okay, Mencius is one, probably one hundred fifty younger than Confucius. So Mencius is later. Okay, so they don't. But Mencius is not, because Mencius also learned from Zisi, which could be the author of this one. So they are in the same line. So they are talking about kind of the same thing, okay, in this way. So I hope I answer your question, uh, Fred. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I think I need to go back and and uh, refresh myself on, on Mencius. Actually, this is really good because it, it highlights that I need to go back and refresh my memory on everything you've taught before because it recapitulates kind of <laughs> everything. Yeah, but I'm glad that you ask because we, that, that just like I mentioned, the difficult of this kind of meetup is we, unlike in school, you can ask people to come every day. But I want to make sure I have a continuity from the previous. And I also want to make sure uh, people uh, not join the previous section still can get something from today's section. And I'm great that you asked me the question. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So let me finish this one. That's the last thing. And then we will have uh, 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 15 minutes to discuss on this one. So. Basics, because I want to make it as a perfect ending uh, for 2022, because we start from here and I will finish here. And I hope next year I start from Zhu Xi. And uh, they have another thousand years history of uh, Chinese I can cover and we will end with Zhu Xi for some, some way, okay. So basically we talk about a step, right? So the text, I, I like you pay the attention um, before you go to the detail, uh, like uh, what do you mean uh, uh, rectified in your heart mind, right? What do you mean harmonize it? So let's kind of look at the, the logic here. It's uh, because there has been debate, you know, uh, I think so when we talk about Wang Yangmin, he kind of questioned on this, well, investigating things, then you go to extend your knowledge. But how many things in this world they have, right? I spent my whole life, I will stay here, right? How, how can I go through this, right? So when are the time you are moving here? So let's look at through this text, okay? Remember, um, if you read uh, Plato's dialogue, sometimes I think most of people complain uh, about this, right? Plato is like, a, Come on, can you make it simple? They keep, Plato keep long again and again, usually use Socrates, again and again, and then we lost. I think the reason is they don't know the syllogism, which is from Aristotle. Okay, Aristotle make everything much simpler. So you know, you know, some primary conclusion, this kind of concept. And same as uh, Chinese philosophy, because the logic is not that clear. All right. So uh, that, that's built through this one, and I'm going to read through that we can discuss. So the text, the main text reads like this. I translate to English, okay. Uh, wishing to manifest the, the illustrious virtues through the world, they first govern well the state, okay. So this one is talking about the pacify the world. Wishing to, wishing to 
govern well the state, they first harmonize their family. Wishing to harmonize their family, they first refine them, uh, they, they self, the self. Wishing to refine the selves, they first rectify in their heart. Actually, it should be heart mind. Wishing to rectify in their heart mind, they first make their intention sincere. Wishing to make their intention sincere, they first extended their knowledge. Wishing to extend their knowledge, they first investigated things. Then go to things being investigated, only then did their knowledge become extended. Knowledge being extended, only then did their intention become sincere. Since intention being sincere, only then did their heart might become rectified. Heart might being rectified, only then did selves become re refined. Self become refined, only then did their family become harmonized. Family being harmonized, only then did the state become orderly governed. The state being orderly governed, and then only then did the world be pacified. So that's it. So uh, I think I shall end the section here. Okay. So basics, that's the Cheng Yi talking about the moral cultivation. He bring back the ancient text and talking about the step-by-step. Step. You will say, you know, from the so-called handbook. Okay. So technically based on this teaching, you will know okay, from the beginner to take care of the entire world. So that's, that's the philosophy. And that's the, I will call it the birth of Neo-Confucianism because it become a complete philosophy. And 200 years later, Zhu Xi is going to take all this teaching and combine together and he, so-called the godfather of Confucian. And that's what we know, okay? including most of the Western scholar, when they uh, talk about Confucianism, is talking about Zhu Xi's Confucianism. So I will end the section here and then let's give a few minutes to discuss and then uh, if you have a question or something, something. Okay, so uh, welcome, yeah. Any comment, question, and uh, suggestion? Fred, please. Uh, uh, let me defer to Joseph. I don't think he's talked yet. Right. You, you go first. Joe, talk or not. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, it it's refers to your prior slide here, your last slide, if I remember correctly. But what's uh, one of the things that's impressive here is, yeah, is uh, the effort to harmonize these different uh, levels here, uh, the investigation of things, and that leads to, to extending knowledge and defining your intention, rectifying your heart, um, and then refining yourself. I, you know, in, in Western philosophy, it seems, in contrast, there's enormous emphasis on self-knowledge, self-consciousness. So that the sort of the parts leading up to the hearts being rectified. And uh, from that moral, uh, moral refinement mm -hmm. is, is defined. And then there's this big gulf and then there's philosophy about, uh, about nations and government governance and so forth. But there, there seems to be a striking gap in a lot of Western philosophy where you won't find anything about families, for example. Yeah. And it's hard to see how individuals uh, being refined and, and hearts being rectified and so forth can lead to states being orderly governed unless you address how people get along in families and how families get along with each other. And I think I find that interesting. That, and I know that that's a, a big deal, that, that notion of uh, 
respect and harmony and deference in uh, Confucianism. But that's something that maybe I'm just overlooking something, but that seems to be largely absent in Western philosophy. It's important in Western, in religion, Christian religion, uh, but not so much in philosophy. I, I find that interesting. And, and I wonder if there are um, really discussions of family relationships in Western philosophy. I know it's true in, uh, well, in um, Hobbes, for example, has a great deal to say about families. Actually, he has just a little bit to say about families. <laughs> I'm hard pressed to find um, the discussion. Talk about, 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 uh, Aristotle right. talked about this. Aristotle. Oh, that's true. Going way back. Yeah, going way back. <laughs> yeah, I really talk about it. Yeah. He talked about family, he talked about society. I always find that Aristotle very similar to Confucianism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. So I, I think your observation is very, I should say, correct or same as me. Okay, uh, it, it's very true because uh, uh, it, I, that, that's pretty sure. Uh, just make it very high level different between Western and there's a lot of discussion on this. I think Chinese or Eastern philosophy is looking for the harmony. Harmonizing is the high score. Okay, and uh, Western kind of distinct, they want to separate things, okay, okay. And the second thing is, Chinese philosophy more on, the, if you see this one, the, the, we can uh, 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 question this philosophy. How are you going to jump from this one to this one, this one to you? It, it didn't give you how, okay. So Chinese philosophy kind of pre-assume Everything is organic one, right? The, from the, my heart to sing to the entire nation, it's just one big organic together. So we can grow from small to big without the theory in you how. And the Western philosophy kind of try to like, oh, that's this, this one is the individual, this one is the family, this one is society. This one. And they, they, they focus on the die. The separate, this line separate, okay? If pass this line, it's family. Pass this line, so I think that's the main difference. And another thing we cause this problem is, if you look at this one, this philosophy, if you put everything together, you will feel it's not only a philosophy, it's probably a religion, probably pretty good religion in this way, without God, okay? If you take out the God, okay? Just become a religious pr practice. So that's the my observation on this, and which is similar to uh, afraid your observation. I, I I think, and there's a lot of discussion on on, on this. Yeah, uh, one thing people like to, to interest is this: when Chen Yi talking about the investigating things, talking about extending knowledge, surprisingly. It didn't bring China to technology, science advancement. In another way, kind of retreat, because before this time, Chinese probably have much more advanced in the technology. And, the, and after this time, probably going backward. And why does it happen? My simple answer would be when the purpose of investigating things and extending your knowledge is to make your intention sincere. And to make your sincere is to refine your heart and blah, 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 going on. So they always have the next step going on. So the purpose of investigating things is finding the principle, not improve your life or advance in science or satisfy your curiosity. So that's that's the other thing. There's many many things we can discuss on this one, and but I I will stop here. Uh, Joe, please. Yeah, actually, Jason, you just covered exactly what I was going to say. Um, and I was going to say actually, I was just going to mention yeah, but Fred already actually talked about yeah, the mention of family is I think captured a lot in religion, 
Uh, but you're right, maybe uh, not as much as in philosophy, but Judeo-Christian principles certainly do capture a lot with family. Um, but it was really along the lines of what uh, you were talking about with um, rectifying your heart, essentially checking your ego. Um, and the reason I see this as so important is your uh, intention and how this relates to intention and sincerity is intention and sincerity has to relate to openness of truth to new information. Essentially, you're not as, as dogmatic about what has been in the past, that you're open to new discoveries, new principles, uh, and, and, and that makes your knowledge, that allows you to actually extend your knowledge, and, and because you're open to new information, as opposed to being fixed and set in one way of looking at the world, uh, and then you can actually, and it and you can extend your knowledge through your experiences and you get as many experiences as possible. So it actually works very, very nicely together, but it's all predicated on sincerity, I think. And I like how it actually talks about sincerity um, because the people, and I find this to be actually true in everyday life, those individuals that are sincere in their um, quest or their uh, search for knowledge uh, for truth that um that they truly are open to new ideas uh so anyway uh, that was just some basic comments because I, I really like the way this is laid out it's been true in my personal experiences as much as my, you know as it is on this piece of paper thank you well thank you joe you know thank you for sharing your idea and that, uh, again this text is I think you can read it in many, many, many ways for personal philosophy. So personally, me, you know, I kind of more interested on the, how does the logic go in, okay? How does it go? But, you know, some would like to read as your personal uh, uh, maxim, okay? So you can improve your relationship. I, I know a lot of people, especially in America, very like this, like this text very much because I kind of set, set as a reminder. Um, your life, your life, because I know someone told me he put this one on the table, so it will remind him, you know, it's like, and that, that's not a bad way on that, because when I read this one, uh, sometimes I will argue the logic doesn't make sense, and blah, 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 blah. but when I read this one, I kind of serve the purpose to remind me, okay, how's my heart, do I, how much do I improve my knowledge, how do I treat my family members, do I think about the, my responsibility to uh, uh, to the state? Uh, for example, did I pay my tax? Okay, or another thing like, um, am I environmental conscious? Okay, that's take care of the work. So, uh, in a way, in a good way, is serve the, the 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 purpose of reminding me that's my as a person, I have this kind of responsibility which I think most of people will not deny this kind of argument. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, please. Oh, thank you, Jason. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would you know, bring that page back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you mentioned that maybe our uh, from you know Western folks like that. Obviously, as an Eastern guy, I, I learned this uh, last three the, the finding oneself, Shivsen. The second one, Hamnai family, uh, Chijia. And the third one, governing well state, Ping uh, That's still, obviously, I didn't, I still remember, you know, by my mind is day by day. That's uh, if from the beginning, obviously from our uh, modern knowledge, I understand this uh, chain. It's uh, if you leave that slide. It's basically from beginning, from external to external, mm -hmm. from external to internal yourself first. Basically, that's uh, um, investigate the thing. We learn the thing from school, from parents. We growing up, extend our knowledge. From we do fail to doing to fail, then to you know doing and learning, keep 
that is intent to seem sincerely. This is important. What do you do with your knowledge you learned? For yourself? Okay, you find for your, oneself. How about your family? Later on, you're going to form your family. How about your kids? How about your neighbor? How about your nation? So this is going to a little bit uh, contradict, uh, contradict or a little bit different of Western for myself, my family. That's, that's, that's like a God. That's basic principle. Normally, for in, in Chinese uh, valued, if you are the you big uh, rights, big official rights, you have big responsibility. It's not focused on your life. Even in Western, we have interest for conflict. You try to ignore that part. Then the second one, you know, the force is re rectifying heart and mind. That's another concept. Xing uh, uh, si, is heart, si is uh, mind. It's the yin extractable. Can you be, if you have heart without mind, or you have mind without heart? That's that's about in the in east side. We are normally everything connected and to work together. Get that's in follow is as long as you can, you got the knowledge, you got the experience, you got you 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 call I could that's and I'm gonna serve for people. Then you can you know okay, do myself first. You, you try to prove yourself, my family. Eventually we're gonna to reach to half the state. It's I've seen. Even, even in our West, for example, in our presidency time, you bring your family, your kids together on a stage. The family support you do the right thing. And pause here. Thank you, uh, Jason. That's a lot of effort. I cannot, you know, quite, but I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Kevin. And uh, if you don't mind, can, can I ask you one question? Okay. Please. So, you know it, right? Do you remember yes. where you learned? That's that's today. I mean, you know, honestly, I learned this from Cheng Cheng Yi. You see, that's right. If I'm right, I, no, that's. No, I, mean, uh, I think before this section, you know this concept, right? Oh yeah, it's all it's from, from my childhood even. Yeah, it's who, build a, like a career path. Like uh, we normally that's we a, a little over speak. Like when you was child and high school, you try to do something good for big business, not just for yourself. Normally for. Uh, that's basic. <laughs> not for your for your family. You see, how your family. I'm doing good, not just proud for myself, for my family. Yeah, not also for my country. Yeah. So you see, this big, very ambitious, but for other people, good. That's that's a very different to our modern practice for myself. Yeah, oh, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, I, I that, that's I like to the reason I'm asking you this is uh we, I say, all the Asians uh, uh, with uh, this kind of society, we all know this. Well, I don't know where I got it. Of course, I can picture one day I pick up the book, I read this, but it's even you don't recite properly, but this concept has been, it been built in your blood. All right. It's in your gene. So uh, that's back to a conclusion on I'm doing this one. I think I'm doing this one is very important for Western and Eastern and Asian people. The reason is this, Western, it's new for Western, which, which is not think about this way, but for Asian also important because we know it, but we, we don't speak about this or we don't, put on the pay table on this, but it's just run it. So it's a way to remind ourselves what we have been doing for many, many years. Okay, so that's the one of the purpose, I think this one. And of course, you can agree, you can disagree, you think that's good, that's terrible, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make a lot of sense, it doesn't matter, okay? But as long as, long as we all know, they have a thing like this kind of thing. So that's, uh, yeah, if you, any other comment, uh, question uh, for today and the end of this year? Mira, please. 
Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any other books you recommend um, besides Feng Yulan um, on, on, on the history of Confucianism. It can be in English or, or, or Chinese. I, I just feel like um, his writing is a little, I don't know. Um, oh, did you, so how do you think he's writing? Did you read the Feng Yulan's um, writing? Well, I honestly didn't have that much time. I didn't read a lot of it, but I maybe like one or two chapters. Um, I feel like it's a bit too acad academic, maybe. Yes, um, academic. It's yeah. I it's yeah. I don't know. It just yeah. doesn't work that well for me. Yeah, it's a hard to recommend, but uh, you can text me or you can uh, in the. Uh, send the message to me on the uh, meetup, and I probably can recommend. Oh, okay, that'd be great. And uh, but the the reason the difficult part is this: <clears throat> for the people uh, familiar, people from Asia, okay, so you need a different book than the people from Western. <laughs> this book I use basically he is written for when he taught in I think Princeton or somewhere. He kind of made yeah. for the Western student. So he's targeted on the Western. And I don't follow, actually you will see a lot of time I insert the new thing on that. And uh, I think the, 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 I just use this one as a guideline. Okay, so mm -hmm. I will, this one. And I really appreciate um, this writing is, that's a two part. Uh, first, I, I, one I appreciate, one I complain. First, I appreciate is he put a lot of effort, effort, uh, uh, Confucian uh, after uh, the Qin Dynasty. So most of the people, most of uh, 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 Chinese or Western uh, uh, scholar talk about Chinese philosophy, mm -hmm. only limit on the prior to Qin Dynasty. Let me right. war in state and. Uh, 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 a spring and the autumn, right? They talk about six school, legalism, Taoism, you know, Confucianism, Zhuangzi, you know, all these kinds of school. But it looked like after that, for 2000 years, nothing happened in China or in the to entire Asia. I know, that's why I find the, the, uh, the Neo-Confucianism, uh, the Cheng Yi, I, I, I find it really fascinating. Uh, but I, I feel like I didn't like fully really understand all the, Oh, all the concepts. So yeah, I'll 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 text you. Uh, I'll uh, send you. Yeah, I need some recommendations. Um, yeah. the additional the, reading. The the difficulty here is this: when we look at the Christian philosophy, right? It, it's unfair to say, oh, they are Christian. All right. You if you want to separate Saint Augustine and uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and uh, then let's say uh, Bonaventure. Okay. They have uh, like the recent uh, Karl Barth, okay, the New Testament, Lutheran, Calvinism, okay, Puritism, Quaker, okay. They all Christian, but they all have the different, and some are very close, right? How does uh, Franciscan school different than Dominican school, okay? Which you bring to, uh, I think it's Benaventure and uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas, they have the difference, okay? So I think that's the difference we are talking about. And just to answer Mira's question, Mira, if you just like set the whole package, I see they are Confucianism. So that's of course for 2000 years, nothing happened. Just like if we <laughs> say, they are Christian, okay? Uh, does nothing happen, okay? So it really depends on how much detail you want to go through. And I believe this near Confucianism is not only difficult for Western people, also difficult for most of the Chinese, okay? Not other Chinese, because people receive the education is only uh, take the, the final result, just like most of the people in America, let's say ask any Christian, right? They probably cannot separate the difference between Lutheran and the Calvinism or this. And if you go back to, if you ask any Catholic, 
you ask him the difference between uh, Aquinas and uh, uh, St. Augustine, probably they cannot tell you very clear what's the difference. And uh, mm. so I think that's the complex situation. From your Lan's book is good because he talking about, he put a lot of effort for the after spring and autumn time, and from the Han Dynasty, Qin, uh, Han Dynasty, Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty, to the Ming Dynasty, it's very well. But I have some complaint, that's why next year I'm going to do is, I'm going to follow his book, but I look through, the problem is, after Zhu Xi, he put Wang Yangmin, which is the Ming Dynasty, then he put the modern time. So that means for the next thousand years, only had the three philosophers come in. Okay, in okay. China, which is wrong. Okay, I think it's even in the primary barbarian society, they then live for a thousand years, right? We go through, they still have something going on. It cannot be like only three, three things happen. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. a part I'm going through and bring up thinking. Probably there's nothing very valuable or impressive philosophy. Okay, but they have something just like Thomas Aquinas or Benavecchio or Carbas, um, okay? Carbas is famous philosophy or uh, theologian, but probably not everybody know about him. So I think that's the thing uh, I bring up, not necessarily have a real utilitarian reason, but I think the study this, which is fun and I think it's helpful at least. So anyway, I think I should, Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Jason. Thank you, everyone. And uh, then I make through for the whole year, and I'm very happy. And uh, then thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being uh, supporting. And uh, then uh, we still have a lot of people here. So uh, uh, thank you, Jason. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful year, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Look forward to next year. Yeah. yeah. So well, no more meetings until next year. Until next year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great. See you guys. And uh, then uh, see you sometime. <laughs> yeah. Take, take care, Jason. All right. Okay. Bye. Thanks.